Today, I'm joined by RJ Talior, CEO and founder of Pattern 89. Welcome. Hey, thank you very much. Now, RJ, my understanding is that you're a national uh, uh, swimming champion when you were younger, right? Yes, yes, yeah. I, I, yeah, I grew up swimming um, all through, uh, you know, grade school, high school, and college, and I still swim about three or four times a week. And um, I have won a few national champions um, when I was younger. The national championships, uh, um, open water swimming, where you swim across a lake, um, as well as in the pool. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm a little slower these days, but uh, it's a, a great exercise. You know, the reason I bring it up is sometimes that resolve and determination. And, and for those that are, you know, obviously not uh, swimmers at your level. I mean, it, it is a daily commitment. Rain, shine, uh, yeah. winter storm. I mean, hurricanes, it really doesn't matter. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, what you learned at such a young age. Was that a good indicator or predictor of your future success? And do you think that that's something that all of us need to be thinking about, not just for ourselves, but our for our kids as well? Yeah, well, I, I um, learned a lot from swimming and um, swimming is really a boring sport. I mean, it, it's a boring sport. You go to the pool, like you're saying, every day and um, you just stare at the black line on the bottom of the pool and you go up and back, up and back, you know, swimming miles a day um, and uh, it teaches you uh, persistence and um, you know I was a distance swimmer and um, I am not I've never been a fast swimmer but I've been a swimmer who can just continue on and I've actually learned that that's one of my strengths in business which is hard work and persistence and just putting the work in day after day after day and then it pays off um, I've never been the fastest or the the, the splashiest but uh, the hard work is certainly something that I've learned and you know I've got four kids and um, I think that uh, as they grow up um, they like being in the pool right now we're kind of splashing around my oldest is seven and I certainly um, push them in the way of uh, swimming or um, sports in general uh, just to make sure that they have that same experience and they know what it looks like to win and to fail and get back up and just keep putting in the work and it ultimately pays off. And the thing is, you can actually see that common thread in your career as well. I mean, prior to this, you were with Exact Target, which was acquired by Salesforce for $2.5 million, uh, where you served as a VP of mobile products. So you've, you've been at this, you've been in this field for a long time, uh, which brings us to your current startup, Pattern89. Tell us about what, you, what led you to this particular startup and why. Sure. So Pattern 89 is an artificial intelligence platform that helps digital marketers to figure out what works. We decrypt and predict using AI or digital ads. And, you know, at Exact Target, I was always the guy they put on the new stuff. Um, so Exact Target was known for its email product, but we added a mobile product and landing page product, a voice product, a social product. And it was this kind of messy world that needed to be figured out and um, uh, just needed somebody to roll up their sleeves and dig in. And um, that's what I did. And um, I, through that process, I learned quickly that digital marketers um, are always wanting to experiment, but it's really a frustrating process to experiment all the time and kind of endure that failure. And they would love to know what the answer is before they even start. And uh, the advancements in artificial intelligence give us that capability with enough data, the machine can predict the outcome before it even goes live. So we started playing around with that with massive amounts of data and found that we could predict within about 5% what the outcome of a specific ad or digital piece of content would be. So you know, after working in 15 years of trying to figure out how to create tests to figure out what works, we actually have now the tech that we can test all of our creative ideas and um, you know, come up with wacky stuff and see if it works. And so um, that's what we've been doing with Pattern 89 and seeing great results. And it, it's fun. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of up and backs down the pool, if you will. And, um, you know, the, the field of AI is just really emerging. And it's been another place to experiment and, and learn and, um, you know, satisfy my personal and business interests, but also solve a critical problem for our customers. Yeah, so just put a little bit of context for listeners is that, you know, currently digital marketers have to do a lot of A-B testing and there's costs associated with it because if they run a Google ads, Facebook ads on the creative, 
they have to actually spend, you know, add budget to see what the results are. Not to mention you're potentially sending multiple messages into the marketplace. So here, before you actually go live in any type of production environment, you're actually seeing and experimenting, you know, how these creative changes, whether it's character length, body copy, whether it's image tags, emojis, basically the, the art and the science of it and being able to actually see what predictively the results are going to be. Tell us a little bit about where did you amass this data to train your AI algorithms? Yes. Yeah. So when we first started um, the company, I joked that I went door to door asking digital marketers for their uh, data in exchange for a beautiful report. And um, that's pretty much what I did. Um, I had a number of contacts and customers through my work at Exact Target and Salesforce, and I started talking to those folks and said, hey, would you let me export some of your data and give you a great report? And um, what I'm going to do is look for patterns and outliers in that data, in your data, but on anonymously tag it with 2,900 different dimensions, and then compare those tags to everybody else's data. And um, then we started amassing this giant amount of um, uh, data that helps customers understand what works and what doesn't work. So um, we about after the first 35 um, customers where we like literally manually did it all, um, we built a, a, a part of our platform that automates that. And um, that platform has continued to grow over the last year and a half and um, continues to grow and get smarter and learn what works. And just like you said, we understand creative semantic analysis. We use natural language processing. Um, we use uh, computer vision. So I can tell you that um, uh, things like if you're a retailer selling a shirt, that a uh, picture of a man wearing a blue shirt and a, a sport coat um, is gonna perform better than a man in a plaid shirt with glasses and brown hair. Um, and so we can identify for different audiences what's driving the better performance? Should the background be white? Should it be red? Should it be green? Should it be a mountain? Should there be a bicycle in the picture? All these sorts of dimensions are human decisions that somebody decides. And if the computer can identify what would be the outcomes of all of those different questions, then we could make better human decisions that better reflect our brand. And that's what Pattern 89 does. It's so fascinating because I think uh, there are a lot of API services from Google, Microsoft, and others that does a lot of computer vision, uh, tag auto tagging. Here, you're basically taken to another level altogether. And it's so fascinating uh, that you can really slice and dice, not just the creative elements within that ad, but also tie back to the segments or the target that they want to uh, reach. So when you get the hyper focus advertise segments through like the Facebook data and plus this creative I, I would imagine that conversions got to be high so tell us about the financial impact what does it mean for businesses to be using your system yeah well the, there, there's two main impacts that we see one is the um, the, the top line lift on average our customers see a 21 percent improvement in the results when they use our software so that's a big deal especially for retailers who are really trying to figure out what you know how, how to get the leg up um, and then there's a secondary metric which is time saved and the amount of time that humans spend on amassing exporting pivot tables creating reports, all those types of things, only on their own set of data is just, there's a ton of time. We have business analysts that do all this work or data teams that do this rote work. The machines can do it better, finding patterns and outliers, and we can train the machines to surface those insights to us. So it's a top line improvement, but then there's a time saved. And then the outcome is that humans can do more human work, strategy, creativity, brand voice, making ethical decisions, those types of things that humans can only do um, is, is the ultimate outcome here. And, um, you know, I, I have a master's in English, so I really um, value creativity and I love things that make us more creative and kind of paradoxically machines are doing that. So that's the kind of the fun extra benefit. Yeah, I really like the way you articulated um, the symbiotic relationship of such an automating tool and then relative to enabling humans to focus on their core competency around creativity, around innovation, things that machines are not necessarily going to do as well. 
Mm -hmm. And that allows for the higher productivity and performance. So I think that secondary benefit is, is a huge lift, um, and I can already see that. Now, the other question I had is uh, YouTube, for example, I think they already are in the plans or already have launched uh, their predictive analytics around uh, video thumbnails. So based on the artwork and the layout and the copy, they can predict how well that video is going to uh, perform. Why aren't Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, and others already doing more of this? Uh, mm -hmm. They certainly have the data. Yeah, they, 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 it, they do have the data, and they certainly are. They're investing a lot in AI, um, especially on the creativity side. The challenge that they have is that if they were to publish the results of, or my, my view, is if they were to publish the results of it, then everybody would do it. If we knew that blue shirts drove better performance, then everybody would have a blue shirt. Um, if, they, if we knew that it was always have a mountain, a bicycle, or like this week, have a mountain bicycle, 42 character headline with this emoji, if they published that recipe, then everybody would do it. And then their platforms would look a lot less interesting visually, as well as be a worse experience for their, their customers, which are all of us. So it's kind of a weird conundrum that they're in, in that they do have the most data. They would probably outperform pattern 89 every, every single way. But the challenge is um, the machines uh, um, would, would basically inspire the opposite of creativity. And um, that's, that's kind of where, where, the, where the large challenge is. So they rely on new and creative ideas that are coming from each of the individual brands that are advertising or publishing content there. And that's where we um, inspire them. Well, I mean, in some ways, actually, uh, others can make that same argument for Pattern 89 as well. But I guess the way I would position it is, you know, why not uh, for Facebook f to acquire you guys and use you guys as a premium product that is only available to very select, elite, high-paying enterprise customers? Um, uh, um, I can give you my phone number to share with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think um, what, what uh, there's another op so so I mean that that is certainly you know uh, a possibility and you know as we we invest in AI down down the way that that is a challenge. The thing is that AI forces brands to define what their unique value is, and so this is what we stand for. This is what makes our brand different than the other brands that also sell blue shirts. Here's what is unique and different about us. Here's our value prop. Those types of things are even more important in a world where the machines can predict what um, the performance is. So I think we're going to see some pretty interesting changes in the next five to 10 years as brands are forced to reckon with um, those types of things. And again, I think it's going to force humans to do the things that humans do, which is create and go beyond and then let the machines optimize. So I want to change topic a little bit. Uh, my understanding is that your, your company is based in Indiana. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, we're in Indianapolis. So yeah, that's you know, very different from Silicon Valley or, or New York or even Boston. Yeah. So you guys are referred to as Silicon Prairie. <laughs> yeah. Does innovate, or is innovation geographic specific? And what are your thoughts? Well, I, I don't think so. You know, I was a part of a great story here at Exact Target. Um, where we grew Exact Target um, here in Indianapolis to be the leader globally in digital messaging, and we were acquired by Salesforce. Um, and now Salesforce has its largest outpost um, outside of San Francisco here in the city. And it's because of the talent that's coming out of um, our universities, which are top ranked, like Purdue, Notre Dame, Rose Holman. Um, I went to DePauw, which is um, also another great university, but not known for its engineering talent. Um, and I think that there is a, uh, uh, along with the investment in culture and sports and art and food, um, as well as mass transportation, uh, those types of things, along with the, um, the, 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 the tech scene that wasn't here 15 years ago. Um, and then some of the societal pressures that we're seeing from cities, like you've mentioned, like the Valley or New York or Boston, where people are looking for a different kind of life, um, a, a more affordable life, um, one that, where they can raise a family or just um, uh, 
uh, afford uh, a house, those types of things are all in our favor. So in the last five to 10 years, we've seen a lot of folks coming to Indianapolis um, to start and grow their tech career. And there's been a lot of different companies who have found Indy as a great place to, um, to expand. So um, we've recently hired people from, who've moved from Chicago, from San Francisco, um, as well as Boston here at Pattern 89. It's been kind of an exciting thing to see um, and um, one that I know that the city wants to and continue to invest in. So um, it's allowing us to get to that talent um, and the uh, folks who have uh, you know, PhDs in uh, data science topics and uh, from astronomy to you know, biology who can then apply their, their techniques to the work that we're doing here. You know, personally, personally speaking, I attended the University of Chicago, so well, we had a lot of students that were coming from Indiana. And what I noticed about the Midwest, which I don't think you mentioned explicitly, is that the values of Midwesterners are incredible. Hmm. Hard work, and unlike the bicoastals, there just isn't the hubris that we often detect among, you know, the, the elite or the brightest. Hmm. So they're just down to earth incredibly friendly, high integrity, and I've just been so impressed with every Midwestern person that I've ever met. Oh, thanks, thanks. We, we, we uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was born and I was raised here in Indianapolis, so I, I do take that as a compliment, and, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're proud of that heritage. That was a perfect example of uh, the difference between somebody from the Midwest versus the West Coast or the other New York is, Bicosa would have said, oh, yeah, of course. Everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> My last question to you, uh, RJ, is what was your greatest product innovation failure and what was the lesson learned? Well, in yeah, Pattern 89 um, launched officially in August of last year. And, um, but we've been working on this business for about two and a half years. And um, for the first year, we built a product that was the wrong product like literally built the product and sunset it. And it was called Quantify. And it was a product that helped marketers test more efficiently. So we could create dozens or hundreds of versions of ads and then help marketers place all those ads out there to test all the different variations that they wanted to do. We found that customers were very interested in the idea, but not executing the product. And so our failure was not doing enough pre-testing of the product idea before we went live and, you know, I found that um, all the, I mean, we, we, we did all sorts of customer interviews and product feedback sessions and whiteboards and concepts and that type of stuff. But I think we didn't ask the right questions to really say, how often would you use this product? What outcome do you want from this product? Um, and instead we were looking for the positive affirmation that we were onto something good. So we built, we, we, we built a full platform that we then sunsetted because customers want the answer from the test, they don't want to do more testing. Um, you know, nobody wants to do more A-B tests. They want to know what worked from the test. And um, the good news is along the way, we built out the Constellation, uh, which is our data platform underneath that we've been able to exploit and um, use for the ultimate solution, which is what customers want, which is the answer. And, um, but it's pretty painful to spend a year building and then sunsetting the wrong product because we just didn't ask the right questions. And that is, um, I mean, we, as a result, we've invested a lot more in user research in asking hard questions. And in fact, inviting people to say like, tell me everything that's wrong about this product idea instead of saying, Hey, do you like it? Cause everybody wants to be supportive. Um, but nobody really wants to say, no, that's a terrible idea. Or they don't build it. No one told me that. So we're trying to really, really probe into that. And it's, you know, shown in our sales results and our utilization and our metrics and um, our rapid expansion with the second um, uh, product, which is Pattern 89. So it's a hard lesson, but um, a good one. That's a really practical advice that I think a lot of startups can use. So thank you so much for that. So today I've been joined by RJ Toyor, CEO and founder of Pattern 89. RJ, thanks for joining. Thank you so much.